It's busy in the office, many in. Just me today. Just you. <laughs> we are slowly transitioning. So I think there's a few in tomorrow, but yeah, just me. I'm trying to come in every day if I can. Yeah. Get back get back into it. Yeah, right. Get back into the swing of it. That's so right. um what was I gonna say? So your I guess your team are are they doing mostly remote testing from their homes at the moment? Yeah, mostly, yeah, yeah. Although they are Again, tomorrow they're coming in, they've got testing. So they can do both now. So they're coming in tomorrow. So same project, they're testing from home today. They're coming in to test tomorrow. So but obviously all the, all the participants are remote. So um, yeah. it just means they're in the office together rather than obviously all, all coming in on the, on remote. So, yeah, it's all all remote. Cool. And what, what, so what technology are you using for the remote then? Uh, we're using Zoom as a video conference. Okay. And yeah. We're using Miro uh, for the... Uh, for the client stuff, keeping the clients engaged, getting them to in, sort of add post-it notes and stuff like that, um, and um, just yeah, normal kind of document cameras for. I know, I know, not, not document cameras, cameras. We're using. Um, I'm not sure what we're using for the Apple Share, for the phone sharing. There's, I think it's just. A, I think this is an, uh, a, a native screen share app on the phones, isn't there these days, where you can just sort of display your display your screen so that's that's kind of gets gets plugged in and then we also i think we're also um broadcast to a private youtube channel so people can so again people can kind of log in and watch it via that as well right so they have all these people on the same zoom channel people can log in yeah. and watch via zoom without the participants seeing what's who's in there yeah interesting and we were talking the other day actually about um the quality of remote versus um, kind of doing it face to face. How, how are you finding it? Do you, do you, is it is it okay? Is it working for you, or is it um, yeah? Is it not as good as being sat? Hello, Paul. Oh, being sat hello. in the room. Hi, Paul. Hi, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, Darren was just asking the question around you know testing remotely again, and um, you know the, the pros and pros and cons, and if it's as good. And we we always did remote testing prior to lockdown. There's always an offering. It's always there um and often it was utilized as kind of a, a second part of a project rather than it being the fundamental part of the part of the testing so yeah um you know as, as i said before it's it's an excellent way of doing research there are pros to it and that you can you can broaden your geography um and now everyone's a lot more used to the technologies it's made it a lot easier because i think that was one of the issues prior to lockdown is that just getting all the technology set up um it still have some some uh teething problems but um it's a lot better than it would have been prior to lockdown but um yeah i think there are obviously a lot of pros of doing face-to-face -face, um usability testing and user research you get a different level of, of insight and, and understanding but uh, in, in this current world it's still a very good option to to evaluate um products and services uh, and yeah. to uh, and to find out more about your users great cool how you doing paul you all right yeah, good. Thanks. Sorry, I was I was obviously logged in too early and uh, <laughs> went down a little bit there. Too keen. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I was just um, I was just asking Ali about the sort of the, the differences really in either kind of remote or face to face testing. Hmm. Yeah. So I, I think certainly in the industry, um, face to the not the not having the availability to do face to face mm. is having an impact, and we certainly see it in the work that we're doing. Um, it's certainly holding things back, and it's a uh, we we used to recommend it to clients to do remote when there was a a criteria that's very niche. Yeah. Uh, if if they wanted face to face, that really restricted that niche pool even further. So it made finding participants very difficult. We would offer a remote option to widen that out sort of across the whole of the UK and make finding those participants uh, more doable than anything else yeah. um, and clients were fairly reluctant to do that so it's been a forced issue to or forced methodology to do this and uh, we have adapted well I think I think clients have adapted well participants in the early stages of lockdown were readily available they were stuck at home they wanted to do something else uh, so that made a big difference uh, but I think now um, is the right time to, to start looking at that journey of getting back to face-to-face -to -face as well, because I think I'm um, not being a, a, a specific user researcher myself. I think there's an there's a missing dimension there about being in the room with that participant. Uh, and I think, you know, I'd um, be interested to hear what Ali's thoughts are about mm -hmm. that, but just being in that room with that participant and then maybe not to nip out and have that 
conversation with the client or colleagues uh, and get that feedback as well. Yeah, I think um, if you're doing a very a very straightforward, simple usability test, which are actually quite rare these days, but you know, can you get from point A to B? Can you can you can you do this task? Um, but these days, there's a lot more depth to what we're trying to understand from our users, whether we're just testing or whether we're doing research or, or a bit of both. So I think when you're doing remotely, you, you do get you do get really good insight. You get to talk to people, you get to see what they're doing, you get to observe and sit back and watch what they're all about. Um, but you, you're not in the room with them. You're not. You're not. There's no element of of understanding them a bit more as an individual. It's harder to kind of read between the lines. You're not seeing the body language quite so much. Um, and, and I think I think the when, when you know, the, the trained usability testers are are trained in in how to get the most from their participants when we're in a when we're in a one to one environment. And that means there's an element of relationship building across the one hour period that you're that you're testing. Um, which is to the advantage of, of the project um, and the conversations that can fall out of that. So I think it does depend on the brief of the project. Um, a lot of the work we do, we, we kind of try and get quite deep. We always have kind of a core objective and a core question we're trying to answer for our clients. Um, but we know, we know we're often trying to get a lot more understanding about the users, about their behavior. Um, and he's trying to get the right reactions and the right answers to our questions. Sometimes you can't do that just by obviously asking questions or obviously watching what they're doing. You have to know uh, what's going on between the lines, which you can do remotely, but it's a lot easier to do when you're in the room with someone. Yeah. So you find, I guess you find person in person, just, just those little tiny nuances of kind of what they're doing or how they're feeling or how they're moving or just the odd um, R or pause here and there it just becomes more obvious yeah and then, yeah and, and, and you are in a controlled environment which which you know is, is less natural and and you 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 take that on board when you are designing the test and when we're introducing the tasks to the uh, to the participants um yeah. but you get you get that extra level of engagement you get that extra level of, of understanding um so one advantage of doing it remotely is you often get people in their natural environments and we've had quite a few uh mobile tests where people have been sat in their cars um, <laughs> and that that opens up some opportunities and also opens up some challenges uh, so you know you you get that and, and and that that you can mean you're not getting quite as much from the participant because they're more interruptible there's a lot more going around them than there would be in a controlled environment but it's a little bit more natural but you might not quite get everything you need out of it from a, from a testing perspective. Yeah. What's well, well, actually interesting, both of you, that just following up on that controlled kind of environment point, because I've kind of had discussions with people about the difference between that there being a controlled environment, i.e. in the lab, it's not somewhere that, that they live, it's not somewhere where they would normally be doing testing, and therefore it's, you know, slightly artificial in that <clears> sense. <throat> Whereas as you, exactly as you were saying, with the remote, you possibly you get them in their own environment, some that they're comfortable in the car, whatever. <laughs> what, what are your, sort of, your kind of thoughts on expanding on that on that sort of unnatural environment? Do, do you think that kind of controlled environment sort of is outweighed by the fact that you're sat right next to the, the participant in the test and therefore you can maybe pull out so some of the finer sort of points? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let Paul answer that as, as someone who has the lab and get his perspective. And then I'll <laughs> well, well my, my easy answer to that is, is they should all be done in the user lab. <laughs> 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 um, but no, it's, it's, it is a really interesting um, uh, topic that is about uh, the environment with a participant. And uh, we work with a couple of guys, uh, Nick Price and Ben Cubbon, a couple of user researchers who did a piece of work about um, the participant journey and the, the discovery in, in their work was that the research actually began a lot sooner than what user researchers thought. Yeah. And we, we take a lot of things into consideration about that participant's journey and about where they're arriving and what might be going through uh, their minds uh, that, that could affect the session. So um, if you are taking them as they would traditionally be a majority of work done in face-to-face -face situations, um, we recruit to um, client venues, we recruit to user labs like ourselves and, and like yourself, Darren, um, and also in, in home and very, a, a whole range of situations. And they present all sorts of different issues as, in terms of practicalities and about having the participant in a comfortable state, if you like, to take mm. part. Yeah. And what I mean by that is sometimes some clients, large clients who've got big organizational offices, they might occupy the fourth floor of a big, huge Multi, uh, multi occupancy block. They arrive at a faceless reception. There's, it's a lot of unknown environments. They're, they're almost put into a stress environment almost straight away. So you've got to you've got to 
bear all that in mind about that participant's journey in getting to the session. We've even had clients where they, they don't separate the viewers from the participant and they've got the participant and the user researcher with, with 10 of the team sat over their shoulders. <laughs> and it added quite a bit more stress. No way to <laughs> Yeah, I think I think the the, the 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 best approach is always to be keep the participants um, well informed, give them as much information in advance. We would even perhaps provide them with pictures of the entrances so they're familiar with the building they're looking for, um, and these types of things. I think when you take them again, I, I stress I'm not a user researcher, but I, if, through my years of experience, where focus groups are held in people's front lounges. Um, those, those, they're, they're a totally different environment. And I think particularly in a remote setting where you're not in that environment with them, I, I don't know what you, you, what you will get if, if that's, uh, in their natural environment, so to speak, and that you, could there be pluses and minuses? I don't know. I would defer to someone like Ali, uh, uh, to kind of think about those, those influences. Definitely pluses, always is pluses and minuses, different methodologies, different ways of doing things from you sort of grabbing someone in a coffee shop to, to have a quick look at a scamp on a piece of paper through to, you know, lab based sort of full journey usability test. They all have a role to play in the in, in the world of, of kind of research and testing. Um, I think often the times you've got up to an hour with each individual and, and you know, when you're not in usability testing or user research it's quite easy to, to say oh it's much better to test in a natural environment where the person is sort of getting interrupted by their kids um you know trying to sit in their car and trying to uh, not 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 uh, attract the parking attendant um you know and all these things but actually when you've got a job to do and you've got to try and answer your clients questions try and understand uh, you know typically you know where might be the barriers being a user journey um how are people um, navigating their way around the website um, yes, it's nice to do it in, an, in a natural environment, but there's too many things that can get in the way and that can impact the quality of the research and impact what you can get out within your, your hour. I think Paul's point as well actually is really valid, which I hadn't really thought about, which is actually that starting point. Um, when you're in a lab, there's the first part of a per, first part of a research is the, the researcher is going to be um, thinking about settling the participant down, having a bit of a chat, and there's a bit of a, a bit of a relationship that happens at that point. But before that, They've turned up to the lab. They've met with the with the uh, with the lab staff who settled them down and got them signed in and maybe made them a cup of tea. So there's, there's a bit of a process that goes before that. So they're a little bit more settled when they come in. When they're sat in their car on their mobile phone, having just remembered they've got a piece of research to do, they're quickly jumping into it. There's no kind of transition. And although you have a little bit of time with them to to sort of settle them down, you don't have any control over that environment. I think that can have an impact yeah. on the quality of the test. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so we have, we have got a question that's coming. Um, so I think this is this is actually a great question. Uh, what do you think about recruiting actual customers or recruiting from user testing databases? So is having someone who is actually your customer more useful than someone who fits the demographic of your customer? As al as always, it depends on the brief and what you're trying to do. Yeah. When we do our user research and usability testing, we always recruit ourselves if we possibly can and we are very careful not to let the participant know who our client is um, okay that doesn't mean they're a client that doesn't mean if they're a customer or a non-customer but the first thing yeah. is ideally you don't want them knowing who, you, who your client is because otherwise they're going to turn up with a whole range of um, preconceived ideas and perceptions that you don't really want to want to have um, preceding your your, your yeah. research um, it does come down it does come to if your product is only used by customers and you're trying to work out how to make it more efficient for customers, and that's your perspective, and that's your brief, you kind of need to test with customers. But yeah. if you bring customers in who are fans of your business and fans of your software and experts using your software, yeah. you're not going to get a great test out of it. So when we have those conversations with our clients, I will always try and talk to them about bringing in new, fresh customers, people that have maybe just signed up or just about to sign up, so it's a slightly fresher process. But it does, again, depend on what it is you're trying to, to look at. If you're trying to look at how do people react to our website or our app or our software, sometimes it's better to bring people that aren't your customers in um, yeah. and see how they navigate it as, as fresh users. And Paul, I think you Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite a multifaceted question that in terms of answers and applications um uh, as ali quite rightly says if you are wanting to speak to your customers yes you're naturally going to go to those customers the other side of that is what we see sometimes from clients is uh, and there's a like a maturity process that, that certain clients go through from starting out on that 
user research journey and that we quite often will hear oh, we've tried we've tried just recruiting from our own customer base and, and that's a different kind of approach that's almost like a a convenience factor that they're just going to that that data we also uh, get clients who want to recruit their own database of customers now you've got to then delve deeper and ask more questions about the reasons why and what they want to get out of it because you can end up recruiting just a bunch of fans yeah. and, and there's there's a reason why participants will get involved and if you are the, the company recruiting your customers those who are likely to get engaged will be fans of your service domain. so you're you're likely to get a positive bias to whatever it is you put to them so it's it's which i try to liken it to uh, any kind of research methodology and i open that widely into the scientific world kind of thing is that you've got to start off with your right sample substance if you like to start off with and the and the, the cleaner that sample is the better the results you'll get out of it so the same applies with participants i think we try to eliminate as much as we can biases in the whole process like ali says we never as a default reveal who the client is unless the client uh, is looking for something so niche and so difficult yeah. that there's no avoidable way of not revealing the customer uh, or the client. So uh, generally, it, it is kept from that participant until it becomes very apparent who the client is or they literally are at the client's offices. And we're just trying to limit li limit those biases. Um, we like I say a lot of clients talk about producing their own panels. But you've also got to then think about how you keep them engaged in that panel so that they're available and ready when you want them. And we effectively run one huge panel throughout the whole of the UK of participants who've signed up to take part. We engage with them as much as we can in all sorts of different levels. And we, we run free prize draws and, and giveaways and, and activities on social media because you need to keep them engaged. And I think that's a very difficult task from a client on a customer base scenario to do quality uh, quantitative um is a different story if you want to do surveys and then yeah bang it out to your customers um that's that's a quite a valid way to go about it uh, but again it does work better if a third party is doing that contact i think also it's probably worth noting that the, you know they can be fairly cheap and quick alternatives but that idea of a user testing database often what you end up with is people that are testing websites all the time so yeah. they're often very good at giving you their opinions. Uh, they're getting a little bit of money for it. Uh, and they, they might well have just been testing two or three other websites before your website. So sometimes you've got to be careful where you're recruiting from. If, you, if you're kind of testing your own website and, uh, and, and doing this yourselves, I think it's very, very important to be careful on how you, how you recruit those people. And, and that might be your customers and how you go about recruiting them and briefing them into that. But I think when you mm -hmm. speak to um, professional recruitment firms like Paul's, um, you, you know, you can you can shape that brief as tight as you want it to be, and 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 see yeah. if you can bring the right people in. Yeah, oh, cool, good answers, guys. Thank you. So we've got another question that's popped up here, and I, this again, I think this is going to be a multifaceted answer, but we'll go for it. Um, so thoughts on open questions versus giving options. Um, so are you leading the question by giving radio buttons, for example, in a survey? So, I mean, I guess that's going to depend really on what it is you're trying to find out with the survey. Um, but I guess as far as testing is concerned, we like open questions. Yeah, so, I mean, the testing we do is very qualitative based rather than sort of quant stuff that you do with a survey. We do we do, do surveys as, as part of a bigger project, but we'd never do just surveys for a piece of work. I think you can get, if you're looking for opinions and numbers, you know, you, you can do that. Um, are you leading questions by giving radio buttons? Uh, I, I'm not an expert in surveys, to be fair, yeah. um, so I can't answer that directly. But I think when you're designing servers, I think you've got to take a lot of time to get those questions right because you, you, you're looking to get people's responses as effectively as possible. But I think what, we, what we're all aware of, certainly when we're in the world of user research and usability testing, is what people think they want or tell you they want is very rarely exactly what they want. So hence, surveys are, are normally part of a bigger picture rather than a piece of research in themselves. Open questions versus giving options. Um, again, it doesn't happen quite so much when you're doing observational research. Um, open questions, of course, is, is, is how we get how we go as far as possible. Um, what we'll often do, actually, I think giving options can work. What we'll often do, and, and it, it can work both ways, trying to make sure you don't lead the, the, the customer or, or the participant. So often when we're doing research and uh, they don't know who our client is, but we need to introduce the client website, 
Um, we might have a range of competitive brands. They might have the logos might be printed out on cards or, or there's different ways of doing it. And we might get them to sort of look at those cards and say, oh, do you recognize any of these brands? Tell me about it. Da, da, da. And then um, we'll, we'll sort of, well, let's, let's, based on what you're looking to do, uh, why don't we choose oh, this, this brand here? So um, yeah. we can get them to choose which one they want to go with and eventually we'll, yeah. you know, see if they pick our, our client or not. So there are things you can do around giving options to help you, um, design your test and design your research to drive a participant to a particular place without them realizing that's that's what's happening but if you are again if you're if you're trying to get a particular answer you certainly don't want to be leaving them in any in any particular space and i think the risk i guess of radio buttons or or check boxes is how you list those how you design those how you word those you've got to be very careful because you might be accidentally leaving them without realizing yeah mm. Sure. I, again, I think the, the difference in this question is qualitative and quantitative. Yeah. Um, and, and in uh, quantitative, it's it's all about with the surveys. It's how are you going to read that data? How are you going to analyze that data? And therefore, it directs you more to um, more um, binary answers. And if those radio buttons, you're forcing them to choose an option. You might force them to choose between a scale of um disagree strongly disagree agree agree strongly those types of things yeah it's all about the analysis of the data uh, because it's done it's done afterwards where you know when you're doing user research and, and in-depth research and, and qual you're you'll get you you're getting feedback instantly you the researcher is gaining that information with every interview every session that they do so with with uh, questionnaires yeah you're going to get them to use radio buttons um if you you there are occasions where open-ended questions are used in questionnaires but then you have to employ a coding matrix to try and make sense of those open-ended questions so it's a, it's a different discipline altogether yeah i think i think we've done we've done surveys before where they're relatively qualitative not quite so qualitative as, as observational research but not quite at the quant levels either um and when we've done those we've Rather than going out with a stream of questions, we'll go out with just a handful of questions and they are open questions. And we're not looking to study the data of that. One of our researchers will be reading through all those answers and making their own um, sort of a perspective of that and putting that all together to come up with the answer. So it's not a it's not a numbers piece. It is a, uh, a qualitative understanding piece. So in that regard, open questions are certainly better than radio buttons. Yeah, good, interesting. So I have a question <laughs> for our own today. I have a question. So um, I, something that sort of popped up in our little chat at the beginning about remote um, testing, which is kind of obviously the the route that we're all forced down at the moment to to do, um, and it and it was something that peaked in there about a geographical approach. So this comes from talking to somebody a while ago who uh, they're they're in financial arena and they do a lot of testing in London. Um, and not a lot of testing outside of London. And the discussion was something along the lines of, you know, you could argue that within London, um, let's say people's view of their finances might be very different to somebody outside of London. So in the sense that generally there's a lot, you know, people may earn more money, they may, you know, have a different outlook on, on finances, whereas if you move out of London, and this was based around businesses as well, not, not sort of individuals. So when you move out of London, you have different types of businesses. You may have sort of rural agricultural businesses. You may have tourism businesses that um, are very sort of, you know, they, they, they explode during the summer and are very quiet during the winter. So, um, and there was a discussion about whether it's worth running different tests with those different types of users. So they would still fit within a customer type but their experience of the company, if you like, might be very different um, across those different geographical locations. Um, is this something you kind of come across? Is that is that do you think that's a sort of a, a kind of a valid argument for sort of looking at testing in different parts of the country? Um, um, certainly, ge geographic can come into it um, uh, and into a lot of the research that's done. Um, it, you've got to try and break out of London centric, which is always a big. Um, big area for doing research because of the, the cluster of research agencies and, and user research and digital agencies. Um, the uh, uh, kind of old standard of market research would be sample South, Midlands, North, and so that would generally be London, Midlands area, Birmingham, North, Manchester, Leeds kind of thing, um, just to see if there's any geograph geographical variant. So location can come into it. Um, I don't know so much about seasonal or um, financial because I think those financial elements 
would be part of the brief and the criteria of the of the participants you want to look at talking to. Mm. But geographic can um, get that that national representation element. I think um, again, it, without trying to sound like a broken record, um, it depends on the brief. I think we've often, if you're trying to find a blue T-shirt on a website, you're <clears> often <throat> going to make a massive difference. If you were doing a very straightforward, clean usability test, can you find product at the basket? Often you won't see masses of difference if you if you test people from different uh, geographic areas. Um, however, when you're you know, these days, research is a lot deeper than that. That we're covering a lot more levels. And I remember a particular project, and we were um, doing some work for. Uh, a uh, ferry company that, that travels between Portsmouth and the Isle of Wight. And we did some research in London, Reading and Plymouth, I think, <clears> somewhere <throat> like that. We're just trying to get slightly outside of the local area to Portsmouth um, that were still within the remits of, of, their, of their core customer base. And, you know, rather than just jumping into our client's website and asking people to do things, we obviously started with a, you know, <clears throat> mentioned you're going on holiday soon or you're looking to do a, a you know, a, a staycation, um, can you tell us about this? Um, well, have you ever thought about the Isle of Wight? And um, and this is no way supposed to be um, representative of, of everyone in London. What we found with our uh, handful of participants in London, they all went straight to an airport website or an airline website. They were looking for flights to the Isle of Wight. Um, Reading and Plymouth or whichever the other two um, places were, they all for whatever reason, went straight to looking for, for ferries. So there was an interesting perspective. And I don't, again, this wasn't this wasn't uh, quant research. This was just the, the participants that had been recruited for us. <laughs> All five of them, when asked about the Isle of Wight, they went to look for, for flights. And of course, you can't fly to the Isle of Wight unless you've got a private plane, I think. So there was a really interesting perspective there. That wasn't what our test was about. That's not what the focus of our test was. But it was an interesting finding. So when they're, when they're advertising and when they're looking at that, it's important for them to maybe look at that in a little bit more detail that 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 piece probably needs a bit more of quant research to find out what what actually is going on there but very interesting insight even though it wasn't our remit but the client got a lot more value out of that sure so okay so let's jump in so we've got about five minutes left of our scheduled time we've got about 10 watchers watching and we've had a couple of questions so i don't know if anybody else wants to ask a question um in the chat box that they might have been thinking of the last 10, 15 minutes, then in the last sort of five, 10 minutes that we've got, it would be great to answer a few more if you've got them. Um, and I had another one, actually, your thoughts on putting participants at ease. I mean, we were talking earlier on about that sort of journey of getting into the testing and that sort of thing. So what are, what are your thoughts on putting um, participants at ease? Um, do you build time into your schedules to sit them down, make them feel comfortable, have this discussion, this icebreaker kind of approach? I, I think probably Ali and I will have two different journeys in that respect, um, sure. and that we would do that ha a handover at, 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 in that whole participant journey. I mean, as I said earlier, it, it starts a lot a lot earlier than when they arrive at their session, and, and our approach is um, getting fully informed consent. They've got to know what they're getting themselves into, They no surprises, all clear information, plenty of confirmation details in their confirmation, clear details, phone call reminders, is everything okay? Do you know where you're going? Do you understand everything? Because anything that comes out of the blue or, or something they don't quite understand or they suddenly think, oh God, I forgot where I'm going, that just makes that a bit more uncomfortable. So you make the journey to the, to the session as easy as possible. Um, then obviously on arrival, again, give them clear instructions, people that are receiving them, They've got to have their full names. They've got to know who's coming. Um, they've got to have um, put them in a, a sort of process them in a nice and friendly way. Offer them a drink, as Ali said. You know, sit them down, come, be really friendly with them. So choosing those staff is important about meeting and greeting, and then handing over to to the researcher, which, as Ali said earlier, there's a, there's a process that they would go through. Yeah, I think one of the challenges um, is that idea that the participants feel they're being tested. So trying to make them absolutely clear that it's not them we are testing in any way. And, and the, the term user testing shouldn't be used. It's either user research or usability testing. We are not there testing the users. It is about understanding them. They have been recruited because of who they are and the scenario they, they might find themselves in. And that's what's important to us. So we want to see what they would do naturally and whether they struggle with it or they find it really easy 
that's what we're there to see. So that is really the fundamental aspect of that first part of the process. So yes, as I mentioned earlier, that's a good part of why we use a lab because there's an element of um, bringing them uh, to ease as they arrive and turn up in reception and sit down and wait and fill in the, uh, the form. Um, but also we'll always design our test. So that first part is, is kind of what we call, we call it the interview. So that is the settling them down. How are you doing? Have you had a nice day so far, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you've been recruited because of X, Y, Z. Could you tell me about that? So you just start talking to them about their world as quickly as possible. But there's always a briefing. There's always a briefing you have to run through to say, look, we're, uh, this is this is kind of what, why you're here. We're going to be testing websites. Um, I'm I'm not testing you in any way. This is about understanding how you would use it. Um, so there's there's an element of brief, but you, you, you want to quite quickly move into the conversation to get them settled as well. It's quite essential that one, isn't it? That we're not testing you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure I've heard it heard it time and time again, where they say, "Oh, sorry, I don't know if I got the right answer there." Yeah, <laughs> I think mean, we also find it quite useful to say, "Look, we've had nothing to do with this website. It's not ours." You know, yeah. it's, um, you know, we're, we're looking for we're looking for your insights on this, and you know, mm. you can't offend us in any way. <laughs> we're, we're independent. Yeah. Humans, we want to please, don't we? So I think it's quite it's quite useful yeah. to you know make that distinction that actually you know we're it's not ours. <laughs> we're just doing a job. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Okay. Well, I I don't know. I think we've sort of run through our run through a half an hour. We haven't got any questions, which, so I hope what we have been talking about has been useful. <laughs> 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 but it's always good to have a chat right with, yeah. with like-minded people so um yeah hopefully it's been good i don't know if anybody wants to throw in a question oh yeah catherine thank you catherine she's thank you it was interesting joanna thank yeah, thanks interesting so we have we have done something interesting which is good if either of you guys have a question that you want to do sure. just do that Thanks, Guy. Yep, Sky, Penny. Yep, both of them said it was very interesting. Oh, Penny, how are you doing? Um, sorry, I know Penny. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know where the moderator is. That... <laughs> sorry, I'm having an eternal conversation. I'm here. Hi, Ben Exeter. Um, <laughs> your moderator has arrived. Um, <laughs> um, thank you so much for that. Um, Hopefully those questions, uh, I basically fielded the questions from the room. We've got lots right. of people in the room here. Um, so yeah, hopefully they were good for you guys. Um, thank thank you. you so much for your insight. Um, it's been really, really interesting. Um, if everyone wants to kind of hop over back to the main stage, um, we'll be just be doing a little closing chat um, and okay. giving some thanks to people and that kind of thing. Um, and then everyone can go and enjoy their evenings. So we're just clicking on the stage button. Yes, yes. Right. yeah, please. All right, great, thank you. All right, thank then. Thank you for having me. Bye. 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 Cheers.